So I've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to ta start talking about these real quick. Um, I've got some pictures to show you guys. So this is more of that grass buffer. So this is really just a, um, like kind of like a gravel strip that goes along the side. Um, it gets the, the storm water before it gets into the grass, et cetera. So this is actually kind of what we call a pretreatment. Um, and this can get a lot of your, uh, your solids off and so forth. And this is actually a lot easier to maintain um, than if it were going into a catch basin or something like that. There's a grass buffer. Um, swales, we're pretty familiar with this stuff. We've been using these practices for a while. We haven't been using these practices so much. So this is an example of that bioretention. So this is designed to have the, all the stormwater go inside of this area right here. And there's some infiltration capabilities. There's often some storage, so there's sand or something like that, some kind of media that has a depth to it so we can store it in there and then have the plants um, uptake some of that water. Um, so this is that bioretention. This is a little bit more of a elaborate construction of it. It can be as simple as, um, uh, as you know, going out to the, to the yard and digging a hole and putting some, some mulch and media in there and plants, et cetera. So that, that, that simplified version often we call a rain garden. Um, this, is, uh, this is more of uh, an engineered system. Might have under drains even that are um, designed in here. Um, here's a simple one, a bioretention. This is a parking lot um, island bioretention. So you can see instead of grading our, you know, a lot of times we build these things with vegetation them and, and they're mounted way up high. We just take that principle and invert it where we want to put them down low and we route the water in there. That a lot. Great for snow removal. For breaking it, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, I, the, I, this is used, actually, I, there's a parking lot, um, the, the hospital or the clinic that's over here on uh, Indiana that just went in. They have these that look just like this in their um, parking lot. I haven't seen them. Have you guys seen what they no, look like? I'm just pointing out they're terrible for maintenance. They're hard. They're, they're much harder maintenance. It's the, there's no doubt that the maintenance issue is, is, in, is different. Um, I've seen people that actually like them for snow removal because you put the snow on there and it, you know, takes everything. I agree. Here's the other problem with that is a lot of times that media is supposed to be, um, you know, fairly light and loose and you put the snow on there and it starts compacting it down and next thing you know you get a compressed thing and it doesn't, doesn't infiltrate anymore. Okay. Here's another example a little bit bigger, again off from a parking lot. Here's the overflow point so it goes in um, at the corner over here and goes through this system. Um, here's an extended detention basin. Again, this is more of our traditional. Um, one of the things that uh, even urban drainage is trying to get away from is you see the, the concrete pilot channel. Uh, you know, for, for your dry weather flows, which is, you know, with your car washing and, and uh, what we oftentimes just call urban slobber. It just kind of stuff is always draining into there. It could be an illicit connection. It could be, you know, car washing. It could be uh, over irrigation spray or something like that. We kind of always have a constant flow in our urban areas. None of that's getting treated in those pilot channels, so they're trying to go a little bit more away from that and have a, you know, a rock line channel or something that's designed to, to at least treat some of that dry weather flow. Uh, or, or like this, um, having a, uh, a little wetland or something like that to try to pre-treat it, pre it and post-treat it. Um, here's another example of extended detention basin with their outlet. Again, this is a typical urban drainage. Have you guys seen this, this, these kinds of outlets? This is that urban drainage design. That's where that came from. So, so what about the mosquitoes that those things produce? That's a good question. Because I mean, it's, they're putting them everywhere, especially in, in uh, housing developments, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if I go back to, this one actually is, a, is maybe a good example. This is, uh, this is one that's ponded right now, so the rainstorm pretty, came pretty recently. This is designed to drain within 24 hours, to at least get below subsurface. So that's one of the advantages of bioretention, is you're trying to get that water so it's not ponded. Because a lot of the ones you'll see, the dang drain is three, four feet up in the air yeah. and it, it, the water never gets out. That's so a design problem. That's a design or construction problem, you know. So, yeah, you're exactly right. I spent a lot of time going around different places in, in the greater Denver region looking and finding exactly those issues. I give a whole nother um, uh, presentation on operation and maintenance of these things and that's one of the first keys is has it drained within 24 hours, you know. Is it something that needs to be looked at? Well, they're built for like 100 year storms. That's right. That's, that's often the case. And so, um, so when you're looking at something like this, this can be a mosquito breeding problem. The idea is that it's supposed to drain within a certain amount of time unless it's a wetland. West Metro put a fire station down here on South Kipling where they have a big huge retention basin. Mm -hmm. They put a, some kind of a fountain unit in, in there where you had water like this. If they kept the water moving yeah. through that with that. That does help, excuse me, Bill. Yes, that definitely helps. It also helps to oxygenate the water because otherwise what happens is we get that 
you know, algae to start building up in there and it gets stinky, it looks bad, et cetera. So that's one of the reasons why they put those fountains in there is both for, for vector control for mosquitoes and for the, uh, the algae, algae, algae control. So, okay, so other ones that, um, this one actually doesn't um, work so well for EPA meeting the uh, Energy Independent Securities Act, but we do a lot of underground storage. If you infiltrate it, it is okay. So again, a lot of times our sites are constrained, and so this is the only way you have to store it. We don't have the opportunity for surface storage. So we might use something like this for, for underground storage. Uh, again, if you're doing that retain on site for that 95th percentile, if you infiltrate it, this is still okay. There's what it looks like inside some of these things. And there's all different kinds of designs. There's um, what I call the milk crate design. So there's like the pl these plastic blocks that you can kind of put together. Um, there's big ones like this uh, that are, are um, are more vaults. Um, so there's all different kinds of this. There's <coughs> probably 30 permutations and 30 companies that make these different kinds of things. Um, so all different kinds of uh, opportunities there. They all are more expensive. So that's, that's the one downside as you're going with that. Um, expense. All right, quiz two. You guys ready? An effective stormwater runoff is A, sediment, dirt can cloud water and destroy habitats. B, hazardous materials such as pesticides, motor oil and other chemicals can harm living organisms. C, polluted stormwater affects drinking water which in turn can affect public health. Or D, all of the above. D, e, all of the above. Right. Anybody live up north? Uh, Westminster, Thornton? You know where your uh, drinking water is coming from? Clear Creek. And then it goes to Stanley Lake. And then it gets treated and it comes to your tap. So all of those places can get it stormwater runoff in Clear Creek, in Stanley Lake. So it's, you gotta think a little bit about that, but that's why, by the way, there's some, some boating regulations in Stanley Lake is because they wanna keep it clean, keep more, less oil out of it. Okay, number two on this one. Which of the following areas is one of the potential stormwater contaminants at the DFC? Garden areas. The roadways and parking lots, indoor storage of chemicals, or none of the above? Make you think a little harder. What was that? B is an answer. Any other answers? B is correct. Because right now we're considering the garden areas as holding the water there for the most part. Of course, we have to use pesticides and, and uh, fertilizers responsibly. The roadways are what we're really looking at is generating that runoff and that, that uh, flow to the stream. Indoor storage of chemicals, we're assuming because it's indoors that it's not getting any storm water. And then, uh, of course, none of the above is, is out of there. Okay, so pollution prevention, good housekeeping for DFC operations. The first one on there is stormwater management training, being in here. This is part of a good housekeeping. Landscaping and lawn care, understanding what needs to be done with that, how much fertilizer to use, where to use it. Ground maintenance, pest control, street and parking lot sweeping, de-icing. We haven't talked about de-icing. We use a lot of those de-icing chemicals. Where do those things go? There you go. They're responsible for that. Spill response and then training refresher. Okay. Illicit discharge. This is also a part of that. Um, maintaining existing storm sewer map. So again, that's having that idea. Where is that inlet? Where could our source be? Now there could be something that's a, like a cross connection or something that we don't know about. There are still some of those that might exist on the site. But for the most part, we're looking um, at, at these chemicals going in through the storm drains. So chemical storage and containment, very important part of it. Um, illicit connections is what I just mentioned about uh, plumbing and floor drains. That's one of the goals is, for instance, if there's a floor drain, you might not know that it connects there to that pipe because uh, no water's ever gone down it until you get that spill. And somebody's like, well, we'll just wash it into that hole that's there at the bottom floor. Everything seems to be draining there anyway. So that might be connected to the uh, storm drain and go right out to the creek, like in that picture right there. Um, the other things that we're doing, that Bill's doing, is uh, annual dry weather survey. So I mentioned that flow. Well, when we see flow during dry weather, you have to a lot of times go inspect it and see what the heck is going on. Where, what is the source of this? So that's something that, uh, that Bill's responsible for, among others. Um, and then non-stormwater discharge assessment forms. So these are the forms that we're using to be able to, to uh, track some of that. 
I mentioned turf grass management and other vegetative activities. Again, it's really just being smart and responsible about how much you're using, where you're using it, um, not getting um, uh, a lot of overspray. Same with the pest management, where you're using it, how long does it last, et cetera. Um, and these often are, are generating you know, pesticides and nutrients to our systems. Mode areas. Do you guys know where the mode areas are? I'm sure some people go, yeah, I, I spent too much time there. <laughs> so I, I uh, highlighted in there. There's the mode areas. Um, the other areas, do they necessarily need fertilizer? Do they need other management? Maybe occasionally, maybe annually. They need uh, weed control. Weed control? Yeah. Annually? Once, I mean, once a year? Oh, more than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's true too. If you're using glyphosate or some other kind of glyphosate control. You, uh, basically That's right. So it can grow back pretty quick. So, so you have to, and then knowing how to apply it, things like that. So this is actually a part of, of that, you know, knowing the application, how to apply it, um, et cetera. Here's some of the uh, chemical storage and, and uh, things that we see in terms of stormwater runoff. You can see the sheen right here from uh, asphalt. When we see bubbles coming out of a pipe, usually that's a, um, a trigger for me to say, what the hell's going on? Um, and I've been, by the way, in streams where I saw the whole stream this high in bubbles. And that's not a good thing. South Platte all the time. Yeah, South Platte, uh, yeah, over by Suncor, that happens. But it's also, depending on what the issue is, uh, that could be EPA coming in and assessing a large fine. So that's where it, you really have to be careful. And those fines are, are cumulative and can be very expensive. So reporting, these are some of the um, reports um, that are the items that go into the annual report. Uh, I just listed them up here so you guys are aware. You don't have to go through this. The ones in red are all the forms that are out there for you guys to fill out and that you think, ah, this is a pain in the ass. Why am I doing this? Well, guess what? It's a part of the requirements for the NPDES permit. So <laughs> we're not trying to do it to be onerous on you and just say, well, we don't trust you. It's part of the permit, and we keep track of these, and we put them in that, and we submit it on an annual report to EPA every year. So it's important. Oh, quiz three, all right. We're nearly done. You guys ready? If a spill occurs on DFC grounds, the appropriate action would be? Hey, hey pretend <laughs> that you didn't see it. Walk away. Go on with your job as usual. B, get a water hose and try to clean it up. <coughs> C, contact your supervisor and report it directly to the environmental program manager. How many fire trucks did you get on site? <laughs> or call 911 and report the spill. <laughs> C. Also C, it can be C, but depending on the size the, of the spill. That's right. There are other procedures. That there are other procedures, and, and you're right. And it depends on what the, what the, and what the chemical is, is right. because it, maybe 911 is the proper response. <laughs> the fire department can hose it down faster. <laughs> right. They've got bigger hoses. All right. Next one. Who should be aware of stormwater management requirements and pollution prevention of the site? The GSA environmental program manager, only the maintenance and custodial staff, the director of the DFC service center, the one who's signing the, per the name to the permit, only the on-site contractors or everyone. Everyone. Everyone is responsible, only, right? Only Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> only Jesse. <laughs> All right, last one. The purpose of the stormwater training that we're here today is to provide a hazardous material response plan. We got that together, right? You guys, you're working on it right now, right? You got your hazardous material response plan done? Mm -hmm. Prevent or minimize the introduction of pollutants into water of the state, or design a stormwater pollution mascot for the DFC. Doesn't look like me, I can tell you that. <laughs> Both A and C. Do we want to do C? Uh, no. Let's just do B. To prevent or minimize the introduction of pollutants. That's right. We really want to minimize that. That's the purpose why we're here. Also to let you guys know that, you know, part of the reason why you're here is that we've got all those forms and so forth because that's a responsibility for the Denver Federal Center that they have to keep that information. Again, it's not just to be a pain in the ass. It's to document the stuff, make sure things are done properly so that fines aren't levied. All right. Any questions? Any questions that didn't come up during the, the talk? Huh? Who's that guy headed to? <laughs> Who do you think that is? Is that you? That's a, that's a stormwater geek right there. Okay. I'm, I'm doing that all the time. You, we, you talked about seeing the water that's high. And so forth. I'm in there looking to see where's, where's the water, how's it getting out, where's the pipes. Do you test the air before you stick 
<laughs> that one I didn't. <laughs> that one I didn't. Actually, it's not a confined space. No. Till six feet under. Actually, isn't that what purpose of a manhole? <laughs> to get in there, but guess what? I didn't have a manhole <laughs> hook to get in there. So, any questions? You guys got burning questions. God, I really didn't hear about talking about TCEs and, and, and how do we treat TCEs when it comes out. No? Any questions? All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Go do good.